This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Welcome to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. In 2017, Oumuamua became the first observed interstellar object to pass through our solar system. Now that alone would have made it one for the books, but it didn't behave like anything we'd seen before. Several ideas were put forward to explain its origin, including as a chunk of hydrogen ice, a giant fractal snowflake, and even a discarded light sail. But none of these satisfactorily explained Oumuamua's origin, especially the alien light sail. Sorry. But now a team of astronomers may have finally figured it all out. Oumuamua wasn't exotic at all. It was just a fragment of nitrogen ice that was shattered from an icy Pluto-like dwarf planet in a young star system in the Perseus arm of the galaxy and ejected into interstellar space half a billion years ago. Okay, that does sound kind of exotic, but as we'll see, this new analysis not only explains Oumuamua's origin and strange behavior, but suggests that these kinds of objects may be more common than previously thought. In other words, Oumuamua may be the first detection of a sample of an exoplanet brought to us. So today we're going to talk about how Oumuamua's origin can be explained as a chip off the old exopluto. But first, I would like to thank Magellan TV, who are very kindly sponsoring today's video. Magellan curates award-winning documentaries on history, art, nature, and of course, space and science. For example, Planet Hunters, The Search for Earth's Twin, talks about the search for a planet just like ours, with the right size, the right orbit around its star, and temperatures that are neither too hot nor too cold to support life. New programs are added weekly and can be watched on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, and iOS. And now Magellan is offering my viewers 30% off an annual membership. Even better, this offer is available for both new and returning members alike. So if you've been watching along with me but let your subscription lapse, Magellan has you covered. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. When Oumuamua was discovered in October 2017, it had already made its closest approach to the sun and was heading out from the inner solar system. Working backward, it was clear that it was on a hyperbolic orbit. In other words, it came from interstellar space and buzzed the sun, never to return. What an exciting observation that was. I mean, it was our first recorded interstellar object. But everything about Oumuamua just seemed to defy explanation. Its light curve suggested it was shaped either like a cigar or a pancake with axis ratios between 5 to 1 all the way up to 10 to 1. Even the hamburger-shaped Ultima lobe of Arakoth has an axis ratio of about 2 to 1, and that was considered surprisingly flat. Oumuamua's axis ratio, at the very least, was more than twice as extreme. When the Spitzer Space Telescope tried to observe Oumuamua in the infrared, it didn't see anything. And that meant Oumuamua couldn't have been more than a couple of hundred meters across, or else Spitzer would have picked up its thermal emission. But in order to be that small, and still be visible in optical telescopes, it had to be very reflective. That is, it needed to have a high albedo. But the weirdest thing about Oumuamua was that it actually gained acceleration as it was leaving the solar system. Now, to be clear, Oumuamua was slowing down as it was escaping the sun's gravity, but it wasn't slowing down enough. And it was also moving off of its predicted course as if something were pushing on it. This extra push is called non-gravitational acceleration. It's fairly common with comets, which emit jets of gas and dust when warmed by the sun. These jets act as low-thrust rockets and give comets a little extra push. But as if to demonstrate that Oumuamua was not a comet, a second interstellar visitor to I. Borisov was discovered in August of 2019. This object was very much a comet. The only thing that gave away Borisov's interstellar origin was its hyperbolic orbit. The fact that these two objects were discovered within two years of each other implies they must be part of a population of perhaps millions of interstellar objects passing through the solar system. But while Borisov was very much a comet, Oumuamua was very much not. And it wasn't an asteroid either. It was a thin, broad, shiny, reddish, tumbling object that 
somehow accelerated on its way out of the solar system. So researchers considered alternative hypotheses to explain its strange behavior. Shmuel Bailey and Avi Loeb showed that Oumuamua's tumbling, acceleration, and lack of outgassing could be explained if it wasn't a natural object at all, but rather a discarded light sail made by aliens. Now, I would love it if that was the case. I mean, aliens, right? How cool would that be? But it's not a very convincing hypothesis for a number of reasons. Among them is that it seems pretty unlikely that the very first interstellar object we discover just happens to be an alien light sail. Besides, the door was still wide open for natural, if unconventional, explanations. For example, Amaya Moromotin showed that sunlight pressure would accelerate Oumuamua if it were a fractal snowflake. Such flakes are thought to form in the outer regions of protoplanetary disks where it's cold enough. But it's not clear if fractal snowflakes could survive ejection from their parent systems, or collisions with interstellar dust grains, or even just spinning up to Oumuamua's observed rotation rate. So other researchers considered a different approach. Perhaps Oumuamua was a large fragment of ice. When ice is exposed to sunlight in dry conditions, it sublimates, going straight from a solid to a gas. Space is very dry. As ice sublimates off the surface, it would act as a weak thruster and Oumuamua would accelerate in response. Darrow Sethingvin and Gregory Laughlin considered hydrogen ice. Hydrogen sublimates very rapidly, so even a little bit gives a lot of acceleration. They found that if hydrogen ice covered just 6% of Oumuamua's surface, it would provide the observed acceleration. However, hydrogen freezes at 14 Kelvin. Such temperatures are only reached in the cores of dense molecular clouds where starlight never penetrates. It's not clear how an object gets ejected from such an environment or even how it retains its ice once exposed to the interstellar medium. But perhaps other kinds of ices would explain Oumuamua. To that end, Alan Jackson and Stephen Desch developed a sophisticated model to calculate the rates of mass loss and corresponding acceleration on a pancake-shaped oblate spheroid. As an aside, many astronomers think Oumuamua was probably pancake-shaped because a cigar Oumuamua would have to have had a very specific spin orientation to reproduce the observed light curve. A pancake, on the other hand, can create the observed light curve over a wider range of orientations, so chances are that Oumuamua is likely pancake-shaped with axis ratios of about 6 to 1. Jackson and Desch calculated the acceleration for different kinds of ices over a range of size and albedo combinations. In other words, Oumuamua could have been small and shiny, or it could have been larger and darker, only not too large or else Spitzer would have seen it. Then they compared the computed accelerations to Oumuamua's observed acceleration. Water, CO2, ammonia, and oxygen ices were immediately ruled out because they couldn't accelerate Oumuamua fast enough. By contrast, hydrogen ice provides so much acceleration that Oumuamua would have had to have been very small with an albedo close to 1. Neon sublimates at just 9 Kelvin, so Oumuamua would have lost its neon ice long before it even arrived in the solar system. Carbon monoxide is ruled out because its sublimation temperature is high enough that Spitzer likely would have seen it. Methane ices are a thing, and we've detected them on Pluto, but only in trace amounts. And the methane that we have found on Pluto was dissolved in nitrogen ice. But nitrogen ice, on the other hand, exists in large quantities on Pluto. In fact, the large Sputnik Basin is a sea of rolling dunes of nitrogen ice. It's also found on Neptune's moon Triton and in other Kuiper Belt objects. And it can give Oumuamua the right acceleration in two circumstances. The first is if Oumuamua had a slightly larger radius but a low albedo of 0.1. The second is a smaller radius and a higher albedo of 0.64. Remarkably, this higher albedo is very close to those of Pluto and Triton, our solar system's very own nitrogen ski resorts. But all of this raises an important question. 
Would nitrogen ice survive a close flyby of the sun? To find out, Jackson and Desch modeled Oumuamua's close encounter. At perihelion, Oumuamua closed to within 0.255 AU. That's a quarter of the distance from the Earth to the Sun. At that distance, Oumuamua would have lost nitrogen ice at a very high rate. However, evaporating ice carries away heat and actually cools the ice left behind. This is a phenomenon called evaporative cooling. Despite being closer to the Sun than Mercury, Oumuamua's surface temperature remained closer to Pluto's. But keeping cool came at a very high cost. By the time Oumuamua was discovered, it was down to just 8% of its original mass. However, this dramatic loss of ice is what gave Oumuamua its extreme shape. Prior to the encounter, Oumuamua would have been larger and thicker with an axis ratio of around 2 to 1. As it lost mass, it shrank, and its axis ratio became more extreme, going all the way up to 6 to 1. In other words, it became smaller and thinner, much like the way a bar of soap turns into a thin sliver as it's used over time. Even after it passed the sun, it continued to lose mass, but at a slower rate, just enough to give Oumuamua its observed acceleration. Jackson and Desch even wondered if Oumuamua might have lost some of its ice before the encounter while it was still in interstellar space. They found that galactic cosmic rays would erode the ice by a significant amount. Cosmic rays are charged particles like hydrogen and helium nuclei that are accelerated to the 10 to 100 mega electron volt range. And that's enough to erode nitrogen ice at an average rate of 6.5 meters per billion years. However, that's just the rate of cosmic ray erosion in the Sun's neighborhood today. Currently, the Sun lives between two spiral arms of the galaxy. Spiral arms are where stars form, and star-forming regions can generate about four times as many cosmic rays. Over a billion years, Oumuamua likely would have passed through at least one perhaps two spiral arms. During those periods, Oumuamua would have lost ice twice as rapidly. On top of that, star formation was much higher in the past than it is today. The galaxy experienced multiple surges of star formation over the last 8 billion years, probably due to repeated collisions with the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. Each wave of star formation would have increased the flux of cosmic rays throughout the galaxy before settling down to the present day rate. Our solar system formed 4.5 billion years ago. If Oumuamua were the same age, it would have lost about 260 meters of nitrogen ice along the large axes. That's a lot of ice. But how long was Oumuamua really wandering through space? Well, nobody knows for sure, but its velocity suggests it probably wasn't that long. Given Oumuamua's exit velocity from our solar system, Astronomers were able to backtrack its path and work out that while it was traveling through interstellar space, it couldn't have been moving at more than about 9 kilometers per second. And that's comparable to the velocities of young stars within the galaxy. So Oumuamua was likely ejected out of a young planetary system, which means it couldn't have been traveling through the galaxy for more than 2 billion years at the most. Two billion years is long enough for Oumuamua to have made several spiral arm crossings and lose a lot of mass in the process. So much that it would have had to have lost 90% of its mass just to reach the solar system. And that's not impossible, but it seems kind of unlikely. On the other hand, Jackson and Desch found that if Oumuamua were ejected half a billion years ago, it only would have needed to have lost roughly half its mass. That's still a lot, but it's a little more plausible. So a fragment of nitrogen ice that shrank down to 45 by 44 by 7.5 meters at the time of discovery would explain Oumuamua's albedo, its non-gravitational acceleration, and its lack of carbon monoxide, CO2, or dust. And nitrogen ice is not particularly rare. We have plenty of it right here in the solar system. Oumuamua might be uncommon, but it's hardly exotic it's probably just a fragment of an exopluto. But how does a fragment of an exopluto get chucked into interstellar space in the first place? Well, Jackson and Dush published a second paper that investigates this in considerable detail. Overachievers. 
They started by considering the history of our solar system. Models show that billions of years ago, the primordial Kuiper belt was much more massive, totaling about 35 Earth masses. But interactions with giant planets, I'm looking at you, Jupiter, ejected most of this mass into the Oort cloud and even into interstellar space. Today's Kuiper belt is around one-tenth of one percent of its original mass. That means the primordial Kuiper belt would have had about 3,000 Pluto-sized objects and millions more regular Kuiper belt objects, or KBOs. The migration of the giant planets turned the Kuiper belt into a demolition derby, with Plutos and KBOs hurtling into each other, shattering into small fragments of ice. We have evidence of these kinds of collisions. Pluto's Sputnik planes, you know, the one filled with nitrogen ice, is likely an impact basin that formed in a collision with another small body. That impact would have liberated large chunks of nitrogen ice. Many of the fragments would have collided with other bodies and shattered in even smaller pieces that would just evaporate in the sunlight as they swung past Jupiter. But most of the survivors would be ice fragments around 50 meters in diameter, half of which were made of nitrogen and the other half water ice. The rest would be larger comets, and they would settle into the Oort cloud or be ejected into interstellar space, never to return. Now, that's just the early history of our solar system. But we've seen evidence of planetary migration and scattering in other systems. For example, a Planet 9 was discovered in the outskirts of a protoplanetary disk, presumably after a close encounter with the binary star system at its center. Such migrations and the resulting scattering are likely very common in young planetary systems. Jackson and Desch estimate that our solar system likely ejected around 100 trillion ice fragments alone. That would mean interstellar space is teeming with ice fragments and comets thrown out of their planetary systems. Nitrogen ice fragments would be the most vulnerable to cosmic rays. Most of them might only survive for about a billion years, whereas water ice fragments fare a little better, surviving for around 3 billion years. Now, given their lower survival rate, nitrogen fragments might make up just 10% of the fragments reaching our solar system. But nitrogen ice has a much higher albedo than water, so it's easier to detect. Comets are even more rare because they're more massive and harder to toss out of their home systems. But they're also larger and brighter and are therefore easier to detect. So perhaps then it's not surprising that the first two interstellar objects we discovered was a nitrogen ice fragment and a comet. If Oumuamua were ejected a half billion years ago and was traveling at a rate of 9 kilometers per second, then it would have traversed over 3.6 kiloparsecs of the galaxy. Given that distance and its direction of approach, it likely originated somewhere in the Perseus arm of the galaxy, which just happens to host a number of young star systems. Granted, all of this is based on a model, but it's a detailed model that, so far, appears to be a very plausible explanation for Oumuamua's strange behavior. Unfortunately, Oumuamua is gone. We'll probably never know just what it was. But this analysis predicts that there should be many more such fragments of both nitrogen and water ice passing through our solar system. The Vera C. Rubin Survey Telescope will be able to test this prediction. By scanning the entire night sky night after night, it will catch anything moving all the way down to 27th magnitude. That should be faint enough to detect both nitrogen and water ice fragments. If Jackson and Desha are right, then we'll soon be studying bits of exoplanets as they float on by. Or alien hardware, whatever. My thanks as always to my Patreon supporters for helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy going, and I'd like to welcome my newest patrons, Tom Bach, Kaylee Heakin, Craig Montgomery, and Vijay Anadad Sodadasi, along with special thanks to Anna, Ricky, and Travis for their intergalactic level support, and Michael Dowling, Stephen J. Morgan, and Morrison Wild for their cosmological level support. If you'd like to help support Launchpad for the price of a cup of coffee every month, well, please check out my Patreon page. And if you'd like to join me on this journey through this incredible universe of ours, well, please make sure you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, stay home, stay healthy, and stay curious, my friends.